We are uh, obviously doing things a little bit different here this morning, and uh, you know that this is the month that we emphasize uh, stewardship in our church, so this morning we're going to begin with a short skit about stewardship.
think of anything besides food? We're trying to have a serious conversation here. Well, hey, who are y'all? We thought we got away from the world. Oh, hey, how are you guys doing? Well, you know, I couldn't help but overhearing you to you and your uh, your conversation. You do know that you can change the world, right? Who are you kidding? This world is just too messed up. There's no way we can fix it. Well, you're a Christian. Are you a Christian? Uh, yes, all, all of us are. Well, are you a member of a church? Yeah, we're members of the Ray City First Baptist Church. But how can that fix anything? The world is just in a really dark place right now. Well, as Christians, we are the light of the world, so we, we can make a difference. Uh, not this old world. It's just too messed up. We're not missionaries or anything. What can we do? Well, first of all, you can pray about all the things that you're worried about, and then you can share your gifts of time, uh, talent, and money. You must be Baptist, too. <laughs> money usually comes up in a, ba in a uh, Baptist conversation. <laughs> well... That's not always true. Haven't you heard of the grace of giving? It's more blessed to give than to receive. And we, our giving gives us the opportunity to, uh, to send missionaries all over the world. Oh, okay. But I still don't see how that can help or how we can help. Well, do you know your pastor? We know all three of our pastors, Brother Robbie, Kevin, and Charles. Well, then I'm sure your pastors have talked to you about, uh, about the widow's might, how she gave everything that she had, or how Mary poured out her perfume on Jesus' feet, or how more blessed to give than to receive, and how every good and perfect gift comes from God. You're both saying some really good things, but I just lost my job because of this COVID-19 thing. I'm worried about taking care of my family. I just don't see how I can help. We have a it's a political mess we're in. That's why I don't even think I'm going to vote this time. Well, you can start by voting and also by thinking about how you can uh, prepare for your church's budget this year. Because this is the season in which churches are planning their budgets. I know. You're talking about our stewardship campaign. What's stewardship? We'll tell you later. Well, I can tell you right now, you don't expect too much out of me because I'm old and I'm slow and I'm on a very fixed income. <laughs> well, you know, uh, do you, have you ever thought about, uh, you, you know who provides that income, right, that you've got? And uh, don't you realize that God is the owner of uh, everything that we have? Anyway, uh, God's plan for giving is proportional. It's not about uh, how much you give, but it's about how you give that matter. Yeah, it's through our gifts that we have the opportunity to, to do so many different things. It's through our gifts that our church has the ability to reach our community and send missionaries all over the world. It's through these gifts that we have uh, the, the ability to build new churches and, and all of these different kinds of things. What's a missionary? We'll tell you later. <laughs> That's great, but I can't preach. I'm not a teacher, and I don't have much money. And I'm shy, so maybe the Lord will just have to depend on somebody else. Well, at least we hope that we've given you some things to think about. We hope that you enjoy your weekend. Well, I think it's time for us to head out. You want to race back to camp? I think I'll just walk. <laughs> What's wrong, you chicken? Did I hear chicken? <laughs> no, I'm tired. <clears throat> you know, they were right. We shouldn't be up here complaining and feeling sorry for ourselves if we're not willing to do something to make things better. Yeah, maybe we can stop getting chicken takeout so much and start giving to the backpacks at the church. And I thought of some things that I can do to help people with, even if I have to wear a mask and social distance. After all, uh, we're all able to do something, even if we are slow and old. But we're members of the body of Christ, and he needs our help also, even though we're old. 
I'm so glad that someone reminded us today about our gifts, no matter how small or important. I don't think I've ever thought about giving as a grace. How can we not give and serve when we remember that the grace that Christ has extended to us? Yes, I, and that gift doesn't always have to be money, you know. I learned something else today about God's gifts. Once you've received his gifts, you understand. And when you know his love, then you share his love. You need to pass it on. In fact, you want to pass it on. Really. Come on, we got to hurry if we're going to get to the mountaintop before dark. Then are we going to have a real mountaintop experience? I sure hope so. Oh, I think we've already had one if you want to talk about it. But I'm still hungry. Spiritually or physically? So if you'll turn to him, 583, 583, O Zion Haste, 583. Everybody will grab him a hymnal. We're going to do the first and the last. <clears throat> o Zion Haste, thy mission high fulfilling to tell to all the world that God is light, that he who made all nations is not willing, one soul should perish, lost in shades of night, <clears throat> published glad tidings, Tidings of peace, tidings of Jesus, redemption and release, give of thy sons to bear the message glorious, give of thy wealth to speed them on their way. Everybody. Good morning. It is so good to be here today, and I hope that you enjoyed that play and, and what that was bringing out about our the grace of our ability to give. Well, I wanted to, one, say welcome, and to thank you if you are a guest for, uh, for coming and joining us today. It's such an opportunity and such a blessed opportunity that we have to be able to provide it all the ways that we can uh, for you to be able to, to join us, and we want to encourage you to... Um, we want to encourage you that if you are a guest to go to our website, you can fill out a brief connection form. It just gives us the opportunity to get to know you just a little bit, as well as uh, to pray for you. And so we, we want to be a church that is praying for our community and praying for you as guests as well. We also want to encourage, continue to encourage social distancing, which is why we're offering the mask only area in the back, as well as the um, offering box that's located next to the door as you walk out. Uh, of the building. Uh, today, we also want to make mention, as we've already done, that um, 
stewardship emphasis is something that, that is important to us and that is important to the way that we think through because where we give our money is what shows where we put our time and where we put our heart. Uh, and so I want to encourage you guys to just think through about how our church is going to be doing some of these things. As well, tonight we're going to be having a Sunday school uh, teacher's training. If you are a Sunday school teacher or you are a teacher of some kind within our church, I encourage you to be at that training. It's at the Outreach Center at 6 p.m. So if you would please attend that. This is just an opportunity for us to think through what it means for you as a teacher to, as, to be a disciple within our church and to be a disciple maker within our church. As well, I want to I wanna give uh, our church a praise and a hand clap. We raised in the month of September, we exceeded our goal of giving to our state mission offerings. It was, our goal was 1800 We raised 19, uh, 1980 And so I just want to give us a hand clap real quick of praise. What a beautiful thing it is that we are such a giving and loving church. And I want to encourage you guys, praise you guys, and say thank you. And also... One, we want to make sure that we praise God for that, because if it was not for God and what he has done within our body, we would not be that kind of church. And so what a blessing it is that we do those things as well. I want to give you another opportunity to think through what we can do to serve in the world. So Christmas, uh, the Christmas backpacks for Appalachia is something that we've been doing over this last month. If you have not picked up a backpack, I encourage you to do so. They are located in the library. Also, we're going to be picking those back up in the sanctuary this next, month, this next Sunday. So I encourage you, if you have not done that, go get those, fill it up, bring it back, label what kind of child it is, whether it's boy, girl, what age range. Then we will be the ones who provide the ribbons. Our WEM will be providing the ribbons to place on it and the Christmas story so that we might be able to love and serve on those kids who are really uh, in an unfortunate position this year as they've wrestled through all these things while having almost nothing of, of their own. So I encourage you guys, please do that. Um, and now let's, let's think through and orient our hearts towards the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 21 through 28 says, I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressor and guarantee your servant's well-being. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes grow weary looking for your salvation and for your righteous promise. Deal with your servant based on your faithful love. I am your servant. Give me understanding so that I may know your decree. It is time for the Lord to act, for they have violated your instruction. Since I love your command more than gold, even purest gold, I carefully follow your precepts and hate every false way. As Scotty, our deacon of the week, comes up to pray, I want to encourage us to think through what it looks like for us to love our God more than we love anything else. Scott, if you would come pray for us. Bow with me, please. Father God, in the name of Jesus, uh, we bow before you, and Lord, we open our, our hearts and our mouths, Lord, just to have a uh, conversation with you. Lord, to ask you to be uh, ever-present in this moment, Lord, to uh, reveal to us new truths and insights, uh, Lord, into your workings uh, through your word. Lord, that we're not only uh, impacted here today as, as believers, but, Lord, that we're uh, changed to the, to the degree, Lord, that we're then impactful in our community for you. Uh, Lord, as we do reflect on the things before us, Lord, uh, uh, what it means to be a, a good steward, Lord, we're thankful for your love, uh, your mercy, and your grace. And, Lord, as we seek to extend that, uh, that love and that grace to others, Lord, it, it, it can be through what you've entrusted us with, Lord, and that takes many forms, Lord. We know it certainly is uh, our time and our energy, Lord, our abilities and our talents, and so, Lord, uh, certainly not short of our money. Uh, Lord, so uh, prepare our hearts uh, to be a good steward for you in all ways, Lord, in all times. Lord, we, we do have um, beautiful, nice, comfortable facilities that are available because individuals, both present and before, uh, Lord, sought to be a good steward, and, and Lord, uh, we're responsible with the things you're given. Lord, so we have these, these facilities that are comfortable, Lord, not for, not for our pleasure, Lord, but to be able to utilize them, uh, Lord, to glorify you and to be able to share your word, uh, your love, and to change lives. So, Lord, uh, continue to encourage us in these ways, motivate us, convict us if, if needed. <clears throat> Lord, as we uh, also think about what lies before us as a nation, Lord, as, as we're at at a, a very important time, Lord, we 
ask that we all participate in what's going on, Lord, by, by making our voice heard. Lord, please uh, give us the guidance and the direction needed, Lord. Lord, also through the remainder of the service, as, uh, as we open your word, as we sing songs, Lord, we pray that uh, it's all pleasing to you and that you're active both here today and in our lives in the days to come. Lord, we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Next hymn, To God Be the Glory, number four. stand.
giving us a special. The first time I heard this song, I thought, oh, that is just so sweet. You know, there's no name sweeter than the name of Jesus. Not any of us mainly name our children Jesus because we know that's giving them something they cannot live up to. We can never be as wonderful as Jesus. And it does not take away the fact that he is God too. But the name of Jesus is a so sweet and I just I love the way this was written as you get older your voice just breaks so it's it's not going to be what it was when I was 18 20 and I won't go how far back that is can you're not doing me okay okay usually I sing pretty loud but <clears throat> nevertheless I thank Libby for playing for me
Now, now, Steve, if you get up and sing, I'm not going to hug you. Oh, okay. So, but. Now, thank you so much for that. And, uh, man, that, that just fits so well with what God's uh, word says to us here uh, this morning as far as making Jesus number one and that being uh, how we relate to him. And I'm having a little bit of trouble here getting all this in place. Forgive me for that. Okay. I think we're, we're ready now. All right, I, I want to I begin by asking you just a, a really important question. And uh, so here goes. <clears throat> what is this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I know some of you right now are saying, come on, Brother Robbie, you thought some of us didn't know what this was? Uh, but uh, obviously I was asking the question, what is this? And you said, this is a football. And even, even our little kids know what this is, right? It's, it's a football. Uh, so some of you may have been saying, uh, that was just kind of a silly question. But I s asked the question to set up a story that I'm about to tell you here right now. And that story goes all the way back to 1961. Back in 1961, the Green Bay Packers, a football team, were playing in the 1961 NFL Championship. They were playing for the championship of all football. And they were leading right into the fourth quarter, but at the, near the end of the game, they blew their lead and the Philadelphia Eagles won the NFL Championship. Well, that was a heartbreaking loss for that squad of 38 men on the Green Bay Packers team, and they thought about that loss all throughout the offseason. Well, imagine their surprise and a little bit of shock when their coach, Vince Lombardi, got in front of that squad of 38 men on the first day of training camp. These were 38 men who had played football all their lives. They had studied it. They had lived it. They were trained, and they were experienced. Imagine their surprise when on the very first day of training camp, their coach stood in front of them and said, Gentlemen, this is a football, as if they didn't know. And you can imagine maybe being one of those players saying, come on, coach, we know this is a football. We're ready to get on with devising better plays and finding ways where we can win the championship next year. But Coach Lombardi used that question to help them understand and know that this particular training camp, they were going to get back to basics. They were going to learn again how to block. They were going to learn again how to tackle, how to throw the ball, how to run with the ball. They got back to basics, and to make a long story short, that following season they did win the NFL championship, and it was due in large part to their willingness to get back to the basics. Now I want you to hold on to that idea, this idea of getting back to the basics. We're going to apply that here in just a few moments. Now we're in the midst of a series of sermons here today in the book of Isaiah. Now this series is called, This Is Our God. And what we're doing is we're allowing the book of Isaiah to help us have an accurate picture of God. To help us know who He is and what He's done for us and how we can properly respond to Him. Now that was something that the people in Judah needed to hear as well. And that's why God sent Isaiah to be their prophet. To help them remember who God was and is and what he had done for them and how they can rightfully respond to him. Now, this morning's sermon, as part of our way of trying to get an accurate picture of God, is titled, He Renews. And it's based upon Isaiah, the 40th chapter, verses 18 through 30. So pull your Bibles out, turn to that passage of Scripture right now. We're going to be looking at these verses here in just a few moments. Now, while you're turning there, let me just tell you or remind you that here we are, we're at chapter 40 in the book of Isaiah. We've gone through 39 chapters in a survey, so to speak. And throughout those 39 chapters, Isaiah has not only been preaching and speaking to the people about God and, and who he is and what he's done for them, but he's also been warning them of a future event. And that future event was exile. He was helping them to see through his preaching and his prophecy that if they didn't straighten up, if they didn't return back to God, God was using Isaiah as his spokesman to tell them that because of their rebellion, if they didn't repent of that, there was coming a day in the future when they would be exiled to the nation of Babylon. Now, church, we'll just go ahead and say that eventually that did happen. The nation of Babylon came and overthrew the city of Jerusalem, took captives from Jerusalem, able-bodied people, and replanted them in Babylon. 
And that was going to be a hardship for these people. And so throughout these 39 chapters, Isaiah has been saying, you've got to return to the Lord. Don't allow this to bring about this punishment, this way of God letting you experience the consequences of your sin. Now this hardship, as, as Isaiah speaks about it, he makes it very plain to them that it was the consequence of their rebellion against God. It was the result of them forgetting the basics about their covenant relationship with God. And there's the connection. And that leads us to a pretty important truth here this morning, one that we're going to put up on the screen because uh, this really guides our time together in God's Word. And we need to deal with this and bring it into our own daily lives here this morning. So up on the screen, this is what we're going to put. Forgetting the basic truth about God will eventually lead us into spiritual exile. That's what this passage of Scripture really speaks to uh, this morning. Now, what do I mean by spiritual exile? Well, spiritual exile means when we feel cut off from God. I won't ask how many of you have experienced that. But I know that I personally have had those times in my life when, as some people say, my prayers were just bounced off the ceiling. Have you ever, you understand what I'm saying when I mention that? You're you're, you're not aware or not experiencing God's voice or His activity in your life. You feel cut off from God and you're you're not seeing Him present and uh, working in your life. Now church, when we find ourselves in that place of spiritual exile, When we feel cut off from God, that's a sign to us that we need spiritual renewal. And the way for us to be spiritually renewed is to get back to the basics of our relationship with God. Now listen, I'm, I'm comfortable saying this morning that this sermon may not be for everyone. But this sermon is for the person who today who has the wherewithal to evaluate their spiritual condition here this morning and say, you know... I'm getting to the place in my assessment of my relationship with God where I realize that I'm not seeing Him working in my life. I'm not hearing Him speak to me. I'm not aware of His work and His movement in my life. I'm preaching this morning to that person who's here today who's saying, you know, to some degree, that's me. I am in spiritual exile. I feel cut off from God. Now listen, you may not know how you got there, but I'm here to tell you how you can get back. And one of the ways that we do that is by getting back to the basics of our relationship with God. So, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture here this morning with that in mind. As God spoke through the prophet Isaiah to the people, He spoke prophetically about the coming exile as if it had already happened. But in the process of that, He began to confront them with what led to that exile and to encourage them to get back to the basics of their relationship with God. So you've got your Bibles open. We're going to look at some verses here this morning together. We're going to begin at verse 18, and we're going to look at verse 18 through verse 26 as a whole. But let me just go ahead and tell you that what we're going to see in these verses is this very important truth about God. God is incomparable. Or, if you say it differently, incomparable, either way. But that's the truth that these verses tell us. God is incomparable. Let's look at verses 18 through 26. With whom will you compare God? What likeness will you set up for comparison with Him? An idol? Something that a smelter casts and a metal worker plates with gold and makes silver chains for? A poor person contributes a wood for a pedestal that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not fall over. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not considered the foundations of the earth? God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He reduces princes to nothing and makes judges of the earth like a wasteland. They are barely planted, barely sown. Their stem hardly takes root in the ground. When he blows on them and they they wither, and a whirlwind carries them away like stubble. In those verses there, we heard a word being repeated, compare. And the question was, how or who would we compare God to? And the answer to that is, well, no one or nothing. God is incomparable. You can't compare him to anybody or anything. He's above and over all things. 
Now, I want to draw a straight line from this truth about God, that God is incomparable. Nothing compares to God. I want to draw a straight line from that to the issue, issue of renewal, okay? Why, why, how do these two things get connected? And here it is. Church, one of the reasons why a person can find themselves in spiritual exile, in need of spiritual renewal, is because they've stopped trusting in God and started trusting in a poor substitute. And that's why Isaiah, after he says, who or what can we compare to God, he immediately begins talking about idols. Did you notice that? In verse 19, after he says, what likeness will you set up for comparison with him, he asks the, answers the question, an idol? And in those verses 19 and 20, he speaks about the nonsense, the absurdity of worshiping an idol. How in the world can something that you make or chisel out of stone or wood or, or plate with metal, how in the world can that affect change in your life, something that you've made? It's, it's nonsense. I'm sure that you saw these commercials on TV back when they were current. A few years ago, uh, Holiday, Holiday Inn Express had a, a series of commercials, and one of them went like this. Uh, in the commercial on TV, you saw an operating room at a hospital. There's a patient on the bed there, the stretcher, and there were people around the patient. There was a nurse and an anesthesiologist, and there was a surgeon there. And, and the, the shot on screen was from the chest up of the surgeon. Obviously, he was doing something with the patient, you know, as a surgeon. And uh, finally, he gets done, and he asks the nurse, is the blood pressure good? And she says, blood pressure is good. He asks everyone else, everything looked good? Everything looked good? So he said, all right, let's, let's close this patient up. And after he said that, he took his mask off. And the nurse looked at him and said, wait a minute, you're not Dr. Stewart. And he said, no, but I did spend the night in a Holiday Inn Express last night. You remember those commercials, right? Just the nonsense of that we, we, is what they were after. We, and we laugh at that and say, yeah, that's kind of funny. This idea that doing so, some, something so simple as staying the night at a Holiday Inn can, can equip you to do surgery on someone. But church, that's the nonsense of worshiping an idol. Are you with me? Amen or oh me? That's, that's the absurdity of saying this, this piece of wood or this piece of metal can do something in my life. Now I'm, I'm confident that every one of us in here that hears my voice and is in this place, I'm pretty confident that none of us have a, a carved wooden object at home that's enshrined that you bow down or anything like that. I'm pretty confident of that. That happens maybe in some other cultures, but I know where I'm at here and, and I don't think any of us have that. And so we all can agree, yeah, that's just absurd to, to bow down and worship a rock or a piece of wood, thinking that that's going to make change in your life. And it will be good, effective change, eternal change. We see that absurdity. But church, there are other idols present than those that are made of stone and wood and metal. Now, let's go ahead and define this. This is what an idol is. The loyalty and allegiance that belongs to God. If you give that to anything or anyone, the loyalty that belongs to God, you have made that thing or person into an idol. Everybody with me? So that helps us understand the church. It's not just about stone or, or metal or wood. Let me just mention some idols that are prevalent in our world today that we have to make sure that we're not bowing down to, that they've not become more important to us than Jesus. One of those idols that is so prevalent in our world today is the idol of personal freedom. Now that's not made out of stone or metal or rock, but it's an idol in our world today. This idea that I should, as a person, have the right to do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want, and to whoever I want, that's the idea of personal freedom. And we see that being disruptive in our society to the degree where it's splitting apart the, our communities. Yet we worship, many in our society, worship the idol of personal freedom. You know, there's another word, and it's not quite as nice, but I'm going to go ahead and use it. It's called selfishness. It's what it's called. This idea that everything has to come under my understanding of what is right and good, that the world revolves around me. Church, that is an idol that many people worship today. Let me give you another example. Science and technology. 
That is an idol in our society today. There are many people who believe, and you've seen the commercials on TV, that it is science that's going to cause the, the resolve of the pandemic. And hey, if God works through that, that's great. But listen, as I've already said before, yes, science may came up, come up with a, an antidote, a, a vaccine for the coronavirus, but you could still die from something else. Listen, when we talk about science, when we talk about technology, we're also talking about social media. And church, I know that social media can do some good things, and I enjoy being able to see my grandkids because of social media, pictures through social media. But there is present within our society those individuals that have invested so much in social media that they see that as their savior. This is how they're going to make it through life. This is how their life is going to have purpose and meaning because of all the connections that they've made. Church, that is an idol that cannot affect eternal change in your life. And we could keep going here, church, and whether we talk about the, the God of the, our political parties, I know I'm going to get in trouble here, but I'll just go ahead and say it. Liberalism can be an idol. You can be so enmeshed in liberalism to the degree where that consumes you, that you think that that is going to be the savior, not only of you, but our world, and that's wrong. That's an idol. Now, don't throw hymn books, but conservatism can be an idol. We can get to the point where we say that that approach to, uh, to local communities and government, that that is the savior of our world. And church, I'm just here to tell you, there's only one savior of the world, and his name is Jesus. So we've got to be very careful that we're not allowing anything to take away the loyalty and the allegiance that rightfully belongs to Jesus. He is incomparable. Now, Isaiah knew that it was more than just wood and metal. Look at verse 23. He's speaking about God there, and he says, He reduces princes to nothing and makes judges of the earth like a wasteland. What is he saying there? He's saying, you know, you can even make an idol out of a government. You can make a li an idol out of a national leader. But what is that to God? They don't compare to God. It goes on there in verse 24. He says all he has to do is blow on them and they wither. They are idols because they lack the power to implement eternal change. But God is powerful. He is all-powerful. And Isaiah gives a great example in verse 26. Look at verse 26. He says, just look up and see. There's your example of the power of God. Look at the stars up in the sky. And not only are they there because of God, but he says he brings them out and gives us a show every night. He uses that as a way to say, there is only one who is all-powerful, that's God, and nothing compares to Him. Now again, let's make the connection here. One of the reasons you and I need spiritual renewal, one of the reasons for why we can feel cut off from God, is because we started trusting in something other than God. Something or someone has become more important to us than God and our relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. So church, let's be reminded of something that's very basic. Let's understand that maybe our pathway back out of spiritual exile is getting back to the very basic truth about God, that nothing compares to Him. There is no one like Him. Nothing or no one has the power to give my life purpose and meaning and a reason to get out of bed. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And there's a reason why, because there's no one like him. Now let's move on here to verses 27 through 29. We're going to look at those verses here in a moment, but I want to go ahead and tell you what they tell us, this truth that's not only about God, but about us as well. And here it is. God knows all about you. That's what these verses are going to tell us. God knows all about you. Let's look at verses 27 through 29. Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert, my way is hidden from the Lord and my claim is ignored by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. 
Now, as we said, those verses help us know this about God and about ourselves. God knows all about you. Now, what's happening here, Isaiah, again, is looking into the future and, and speaking about this future exile. There's coming a time when the people of Judah are going to be carried away, replanted in the nation of Babylon. They're going to not only be cut off from the land, but feel like they are cut off from God. And he's saying when that happens, when Jerusalem has been destroyed and you feel cut off from God and been carried off to Babylon, don't make the mistake of thinking that God is unaware of what's happening. Don't think that this has happened to you because God has forgotten about you or is ignoring you. Verse 28 is what really provides that kind of emphasis. Verse 27 is where they accuse God of ignoring them and, and not being aware of them. You heard it said very plainly there, My way is hidden from the Lord and my claim is ignored by God. They're in exile. There's going to be a tendency for them to say, You know why we're here? Because God wasn't paying attention. He was ignoring us or he, wasn't, he didn't care enough about us to keep this from happening to us. Isaiah says that's not true, and he drives it home in verse 28 when he says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Let me just answer that. Yes, they do know. Yes, they have heard. They've been hearing it for the last 39 chapters. God has made it plain to them that God knows all that's going on in their lives. Their exile into Babylon was not the result of God's indifference. It was a result of their sin and their rebellion. Yet what God wants them to know in the midst of that is that He is ready to help, that He knows about it, and that He cares about them. Isaiah said it this way at the very end of verse 28. There is no limit to His understanding. You know what that means in their situation? That means He knows that you're in exile in Babylon. He knows all about you. He knows all that you're experiencing during that time. Now, as we looked at verse 29, that helps us know that not only does God know about what's going on in our lives, but He cares. And not only does He care, He stands ready to help us. What does verse 29 tell us? He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. God knows what you're going through. He knows the circumstances of your life. He cares about that, and He is ready to help. Now, we've got to say this before we go any further. The people of Judah were in exile or would be in exile because of their sin. They had forgotten God and rebelled against Him. In fact, idolatry was a big part of their reason for going into exile. Now, would God forgive them? Yes. And God forgives us when we go before Him and confess our sin and do that in an authentic way. God forgives, but here's the point. It doesn't necessarily mean He's going to remove the consequence of our sin. God forgives, but sometimes we have to experience the consequence of our sin. In fact, for the nation of Judah, it was necessary for them to experience that so that they would turn back to the Lord. What I want to make sure that you know is that when you find yourself in this same situation, feeling cut off from God, not seeing Him work in your life, not hearing His voice, what God wants you to know is this. He knows what's going on in your life. He's aware of it. He's not ignoring you. He's not off busy somewhere else. He's not forgotten. Church, we've got to be very careful that when we find ourselves in that situation, we don't do more damage by allowing negative thoughts and untruths about God to worsen the situation. And one of the things that will worsen your situation is to say, I'm in this difficult situation right now and God doesn't know. God doesn't care. God has forgotten me. I wasn't able to verify this story, but it's a good story, so I want to tell it to you. I, I have no reason to think it's not true. Some years ago, a Navy jet fighter plane shot itself down. Did you catch that? A, a Navy jet fighter plane shot itself down. Now, this is how it happened. 
they were testing a new cannon that was mounted under the wings of this jet fighter. And so the pilot was in his supersonic jet. In other words, he was flying faster than the speed of sound. And then he fired the cannon. And of course, those bullets went out in front of him. But the cannon and the speed of those bullets were subsonic. They moved slower than the speed of sound. So when he fired the cannon, the bullets went out in front, and they started to slow down, and he ran right straight into his own bullets. He shot himself down. You will shoot yourself down if you allow untruths about God to cement into your mind and to be repeated over and over again. And especially in this particular situation, if you keep telling yourself, well, God evidently doesn't know what's going on in my life. He doesn't care. He's not concerned. That's not true. And you'll shoot yourself down if you keep thinking those things. No, we've got to hold on to the truth that God knows everything that's going on in our lives. And there's two things, at least two things, that happen when we do that, church. When we hold on to that truth that God knows all about what's going on in my life, it does two things. First of all, it causes us to stop blaming God. You know, that's very easy for us to do. But if we affirm and truly trust this truth, God knows what's going on in my life, then we can stop blaming God. And the other thing we can do is it will force us to ask ourselves, so how was it that I've gotten to this place where I no longer are sensing the movement of God in my life? And inevitably, it's going to confront us with this reality that we've gotten away from the basics. Church, I want to make sure you hear this more than anything else here this morning. God knows all about you and your circumstance. And He cares. And He stands ready to help. What will he do? Verse 29 says he will give strength to the faint and that he strengthens the powerless. You see, when you're in spiritual exile, not only do you feel cut off from God, but you don't see any way that you can change that circumstance. If you knew why you had gotten there, you'd do something about it. Well, now let's look at this very last part of Scripture because this is the good news. This is the part that we've been trying to get to all morning here. It's verses 30 and 31, and in those verses it tells us this great truth about God. God has the power to renew. Amen? He has that power, and it's available to us. Let's look at verses 30 through 31. Youths may become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. Now that's a familiar passage and many of us go to that passage of scripture when we need encouragement and that's great and right and good. But we've got to keep this in context here church. Isaiah was speaking about a future event in which the people of God were going to be in exile. Feeling cut off from God. And so he's addressing that still. And he says, you know, when that time comes and you're in exile and you feel cut off from God and you don't feel his power and his presence, don't make the mistake of thinking that you have the power to fix that. Now just let that sink in just for a second. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you have the power to fix this spiritual exile that you find yourself in. Now he demonstrates that by giving us two examples here, and I want to make sure you see the import of this. He gives us two examples. He talks about youths, which we could probably uh, today call children, and also young men. Now, children, young men, those were the most energetic people groups that he could think of, right? Listen, anybody who's ever babysat a toddler, a two-year-old, three-year-old, four, you know what kind of energy they've got, right? I mean, it's almost inexhaustible. I remember how that used to be. Look, when we had little ones like that, it, we, we were just going 90 to nothing all the time. We couldn't wait for nap time because when they napped, we napped. These little ones, it seems as if their energy supply is inexhaustible, but that's not true. He says, they will become faint and weary eventually. You can wear them out. Some of you have gotten very creative in knowing how to wear your kids out. That's good. That's a good thing to do. That's one of the most energetic people groups that he could think of. And then he talks about strong, young, young men. Young men who intentionally strengthen their bodies to meet the challenges of work or whatever they, they were going through at that point in time. These two people groups, young men, children, 
They had more energy and strength than anybody else. But what does he say about them? Well, eventually, they will become faint and weary. Eventually, they will fall and stumble. That's a truth about those two. And he uses those two examples to speak of a spiritual truth for you and me. No matter how determined we are, no matter how much inner reserve we think that we have, as far as our physical strength is concerned, eventually we hit the wall. There's a limit to that. And the same is true when it comes to us trying to get ourselves out of spiritual exile. In the same way that the children's strength and the young men's strength is limited, so is our ability to bring ourselves out of this feeling of being cut off from God. We can't fix this ourselves. There's only one way out of the mess that we've created of our lives when we are sensing that God is no longer at work and we're cut off from Him. There's only one way out. And verse 31 is that way. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. Church, we're not going to be able to pull ourselves out of that feeling of being cut off from God and not seeing the work of God in our lives. We're not going to pull ourselves out of that by gritting our teeth and pulling ourselves up by our bootstrap and just saying, I'm just going to buckle down and, and, and just get tough. No, the one way out is when we humbly put our trust in the Lord. Now listen, let's not let that word trust in the Lord become the easy believism that our world says it is, because it's not. When this says trust in the Lord, it's talking about, first of all, a trust that is complete. In other words, in our day and time, because of the new covenant, we say, from this point on, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus Christ. Everything that I am, all that makes up who I am, I surrender it, I give it to Jesus. He is now in control of every facet of my life. We give him complete control, complete trust. But not only should it be complete, but it has to be concrete. You see, when we put our trust in the Lord, it's not just a decision on the inside. It also shows up on the outside. And so this trusting in the Lord shows up in the way that we speak and the thoughts that we think and the way that we behave and how we treat other people and how we live out our lives. Our trust in the Lord has to be concrete in the sense that it shows up and it has to be complete. It has to cover every facet of who we are. The Bible tells us that when we trust in the Lord, He renews us. Church, I can't renew myself. You can't renew yourself. Only Jesus can renew you. And it happens when we put our trust in Him. Some years ago, William Henson, who many years ago pastored the largest United Methodist Church in America, located in Houston, so because of that, he obviously was a very popular speaker. Some years ago, he was contacted by a church in South Carolina that wanted him to come and lead a revival. So he accepted that invitation. Now the Saturday before the Sunday, he was to go to South Carolina. That Saturday night, he went to bed like usual, but he didn't rest well. It was a poor night's sleep. He got up that Sunday morning and he went to his church to speak uh, and preach the two sermons that he always preached on Sunday morning. But by the end of those two sermons, he was just a little woozy. He wasn't feeling all that energetic. But you know what he had to do? He had to immediately get in his car and drive to the airport to catch a plane to get to Columbia, South Carolina from Houston. So he got there to the airport, got on the plane, and sat down and he thought, you know, maybe I'll be able to catch a few Z's here while we're in, in flight. But no, the person he was sitting to liked to talk, and so he didn't do any sleeping on the flight. And then to make matters worse, there was a holdup at the airport in Columbia, South Carolina. His plane was delayed in landing, and after it landed, it was delayed on the tarmac before they could uh, get people off of the plane. And so by the time he got off the plane and got his luggage, he just had a few minutes to get to the church before the service started. Luckily, he was able to get his car from the rental agency. He got in there, got to the church, arrived at the church just minutes before the service was to start there in that church. So he preached that revival sermon. And you know how churches will do, especially if it's somebody of, 
of notoriety. After the service was over, they took him to the fellowship hall, and they invited everybody to come back there and, and meet uh, this fellow, William Henson. And so he stood back there, and there was, a, there was a receiving line as far as he could see, it seemed like. And by this time, because of the day that he had had, he was just kind of even woozy. He was just a little bit unstable on his feet. He was wore out. He was tired. But he did the right thing, and he shook hands with everybody, and he, he greeted folks and talked with them. The line was finally coming to an end, and imagine his surprise that the last person in line was his youngest daughter. She was in school at Augusta, Georgia, and when she heard that her daddy was going to be in Columbia, South Carolina, she drove all the way from Augusta to Columbia so she could see her daddy. And boy, was he surprised. And so once that was all done with, he and his daughter, they went somewhere and, and got a bite to eat, and they talked and talked because they hadn't seen each other in a long time. And it got pretty late that night, and they realized that they needed to part ways, and so they kissed and said goodbye, and he went to his hotel room. And when he got to his hotel room, he realized something. He realized that he wasn't tired anymore. And he also realized why. He had spent time with someone special to him, and it had renewed him. Now, church, that doesn't capture all that's being said there in those last couple of verses, but it gives us a good start. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're feeling cut off from God, what you need to do is get back to the basics. And one of the ways that you do that is by spending some time with that one who is so special, Jesus Christ. I need to ask you an important question here this morning. I know that this may not apply to everyone, but I simply want all of us here this morning to consider this. Because maybe during our time to, together, the Lord has revealed this to you. Do you need spiritual renewal? Through the course of our time together in God's Word, has God spoken to your heart? Has He said, you know, this is who you are right now? How long has it been since you've Heard God speak truth into your life? How long has it been since you've seen Him work and do things in your life? How long has it been since He's provided guidance and, and helped you make decisions? You know, if it's been a while, maybe you need to truthfully say to yourself, I need spiritual renewal. I want you to know that, as we saw in this last point, God has the power to renew. And he stands ready and willing and able to do that. But you know what, church? It's not automatic. He's waiting for us to do one thing. As verse 31 said, those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. God's waiting for you right now to say, at this point in time for me, I'm deciding to start trusting in Jesus. And allowing him to be in control of my life. I'm going to trust in him. And through that process, the Bible promises that he's going to spiritually renew us and strengthen us. You know, it's really all about getting back to basics. You see, if you're in need of spiritual renewal here this morning, there's a real good chance that you started trusting in something or someone other than God. You need to put that idol away and start trusting in Jesus. If you're here this morning and you're in need of spiritual renewal, it's very possible that you've reinforced that by saying, you know, God really doesn't care about me. You need to put that untruth and that lie away and start trusting in Jesus. You know, if you're in, spirit, in need of spiritual renewal here today, you may say, well, it's, it's just something that I need to get more serious about. Listen, the way out of the mess that you've made of your life is not by you exuding your power, but trusting in the power of Jesus Christ to change, and to renew. It's really all about getting back to basics. Is God speaking to your heart here this morning? Do you need to ask Him and trust in Him to renew you spiritually? Listen, there's no shame in admitting that. I've been there many times. Many of us here have been there many times. The wise thing for us to do 
is if we're in need of spiritual renewal, to make that decision to trust him today. And if that's not my need, then I need to be praying for those who are in need of that because of our love and care for one another. This is going to be your opportunity this morning to say, Lord, I need you to renew me, to make that step of faith and to trust him. It may be that you're doing that this morning by becoming a believer here today. This is your first day of placing your faith in Jesus Christ, the first day of your journey with him. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and and God has made it clear that this is the day for you to do that, and we invite you to do that. But we also know that as believers, we have those times in our lives when we have allowed other things to get in the way of our relationship with Christ, and we need to be renewed, and maybe that's your application here today. I'm going to ask that our musicians go ahead and get to the instruments here. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation here in just a few moments. And as we sing, this is your time to come forward to say to the Lord, Lord, renew me. I'm going to stop trusting in all these other things that I've been trusting in. I'm going to put my faith and trust in you. I'm going to ask you, Lord, to work in me, to bring me back into that right relationship with you. Is that what God is, that what God is asking you to do here this morning? Maybe the decision is to join this church. Maybe God has said that to you here today. Or perhaps you simply need to come to this altar and pray and ask the Lord for strength. For the coming week, the Bible makes it plain. When we put our faith and trust in Him, even though we feel faint and weary and stumble, He will strengthen us. He'll give us His power that we can soar like eagles. Is God speaking to you here this morning? Is there a decision that you need to make? Steve, come and lead us in this invitation hymn. Let's stand together and sing. And if God's speaking to you, we invite you to come. sing just one more verse. If no one comes, it's going to close our invitation. I just want to make sure that you understand, if God is speaking to your heart right now, if you're sensing him tugging on your heart, the right response is to say, yes, Lord. Whatever direction he's leading you in, if it's to recommit your life to him, if it's to confess sin, if it's to simply praise him for all the wonderful things that he's done in your life, if God's speaking to your heart, won't you respond to him? We're going to give one more verse Uh, time for you to make that decision. If not, we're going to close our invitation. So if God's speaking to you, you come as we sing this next verse. If there's a
God bless you for being here this morning. Thank you for that. And uh, look, this week as it unfolds, uh, don't forget about the basics. Make sure you're spending time with that someone who's special to you. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time in his word. Allow him to speak and move in your heart and in your life. We're going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to be dismissed. Philip, would you lead us in that word of prayer and then we'll sing. close with only believe. Good day. Yep. Yep. She's been doing okay.